Welcome to the Global Solutions Global Table on Gender Economic Equity and the SDG 2030 Agenda. I am Margot Thomas. I am the founder and CEO of the Women's Economic Imperative. And this organization was founded in response to the call to action issued by the UN Secretary General's High Level Panel on Women's Economic Empowerment in 2017. I had the pleasure of serving as the Chief of Secretariat for that panel and therefore I was able to join with several members of the panel to lead on this initiative of Women's Economic Imperative. Prior to that, I worked in the World Bank for close to 30 years and during that time had the privilege of providing advice, policy advice, to roughly 50 national and subnational governments, uh, was very active during the transition period, the economic transition from uh, communism and subsequent to that. Um, I would like now uh, to introduce our distinguished panel. Today we have Dr. Marike Blowfield, and she is currently based in Hamburg, where she is the director of the Giga Institute of Latin American Studies. Dr. Myra Buvenich is a senior fellow at Data2x at the United Nations Foundation. Dr. Barbara Orser is full professor and the Deloitte Professor in the Management of Growth Enterprises at the Telfer School of Management, University of Ottawa. Toyin Abioden is a strategic advisor with the Tony Blair Institute for Global Change. She's currently assigned as an advisor to the Ministry of Trade in Rwanda, and she works extensively on a number of policy areas related to economic activity and with a gender focus. The year 2020 was intended to be a groundbreaking year for gender equality. That's according to the United Nations policy brief on the impact of COVID on women that was issued in 2020. However, the brief has noted that instead with the spread of the COVID-19 pandemic, even the limited gains made in the past decades are at risk of being rolled back. The pandemic is deepening pre-existing inequalities, exposing vulnerabilities in social, political, and economic systems, and there is great concern that with the advent of the pandemic, women and girls are being disproportionately impacted. Today, this diverse panel will help us to address the issues and ultimately to look at some of the opportunities to make things better as we move towards recovery and a response. So with that, I will turn to Dr. Blowfield. In one of your recent publications, you addressed the critical issues affecting vulnerable populations in Latin America, including women and girls in families and in the informal sector. Recognizing that COVID-19 has exacerbated these inequities and vulnerabilities, can you help us to understand what are the key issues affecting women and girls in this context in Latin America, but with potential implications for women and girls worldwide? Yeah, uh, certainly. So to start with, Latin America is the economically most economically unequal region in the world. Um, 
and about half of the economically active population in the region works in the informal sector, where their labor income meets their daily needs. So with COVID and associated measures of social distancing, this economic activity has largely come to a halt. Uh, and then add to that, uh, this informality and poverty uh, are concentrated in households with children. So while demographically, the elderly are of course most at risk of COVID health-wise, COVID-19 health-wise, demographically, they actually have the lowest poverty rate in the region. On the other hand, half of children uh, lived in poverty before the start of the pandemic. And so the economic consequences of the pandemic are potentially and already devastating for these families. Add to this the fact that schools virtually across the region have closed, where most of these kids got one to two meals a day. Add to this the fact that especially among lower income households, single mother families um, are uh, highly represented. So in lower one third of uh, the population income wise, about a third of those households are single mother families, right? So, so uh, and that, that number has actually dramatically increased over the last 20 years. So given this, Immediate and sufficient material assistance to these households is an absolute necessity to avoid a humanitarian catastrophe. The good news in the region is that over the past two decades, you've seen a major increase in cash transfer programs that have been extended specifically to mothers with children in poverty. And now those programs reach about 20% of the population in the region. These programs have now been mobilized to deliver emergency assistance. However, it's still, these programs still reach only a small share of the households that right now need aid, most of which, or many of which are households with children. And governments are trying to figure out how to reach this large population, but um, this has been a much slower process. Thank you very much, Dr. Blowfield. It certainly lays, I, I would like to think that you've helped us to lay the table in terms of the issues and the very um, poignant ways in which women and girls are, are being affected, um, even beyond the existing or the typical inequities and vulnerabilities. I'd like to turn to Dr. Bubinich at this stage. And um, last year in Berlin, where you addressed the uh, panel and gave the keynote address for the uh, panel on gender economic equity. You noted the critical need for gender data collection to support critical and objective analysis and to support evidence-based policy making. What are some of the policy areas where there is urgent need for gender data in light of COVID-19, but where there is need for in general economic planning and, and social delivery, delivery of social services. Moreover, how is this paucity of data impacting the well-being of women and girls in the current situation? Thank you, Margot, and thanks Marike for your introduction. I think Marike already has has laid out part of it. I mean, basically, you know, what we need to know how the pandemic affects gender issues, men and women, girls and boys, both in terms of the primary effects of the pandemic and the secondary effects of the economic recession and the containment measures and all this. We don't know. I mean, we don't have the data now, neither for the primary effects on health, on the Christ health crisis, sex disaggregated. There is data coming in for some countries, but for the majority of the countries, they're not sex disaggregating their data. So, you know, that sort of the very essential of how the pandemic is affecting infection rates and death rates by sex and by age, we still don't have. But more much much more importantly is the secondary effects of the pandemic. And that's what we know. We know from the effects of you know, economic crisis in the past and how they have affected men and women. 
we need to know how gender issues, how women are affected in the workforce, what, because women and men are in segregated uh, jobs in the labor market. So we need to know what, in, in order to uh, plan for evidence-based policy, we need to know where are the sectors that women are in that are losing their jobs, where are the sectors that men are in that are losing the jobs. We have some of that information, but it's really not at all complete, and particularly, you know, in terms of informal sector, in the informal supply chains, we have no information. Most importantly also, there is a response that poor households and poor women give to cope with the economic downfalls that are triggered by the pandemic. In the past, what has happened in economic recessions is that women of poor families who are out of the workforce go into the workforce, while women of rich families pull out of the workforce. So we need to know if this is happening. Is it happening? Is it not happening? And there's where we really need sort of very reliable uh, data on actually women's economic participation. We don't have that reliable data yet. So I think that this offers an opportunity to sharpen the way that we are measuring women's work and women's economic participation. Thank you. Thank you very much. And you, you've really um, helped us to shift into the, the space of looking at the opportunities, what needs to be done. You've also touched on the fact that, um, and I think that we are increasingly becoming aware of, this pandemic, it's global in nature, um, we've had previous pandemics that were restricted to certain parts of the world and didn't spread as rapidly as this one. So it's a, a big shock globally, as we're seeing unfolding. But there is a thinking that this is just a signal or the beginning of a trend that we will see. So it's really taking us to this issue of resiliency and how we build resiliency. But again, focusing for the purpose of this discussion, recognizing the economic contribution of women and therefore the importance of assuring the, uh, or facilitating their um, economic contribution in order to leverage that for the good of every, all of society. So it's in that context now that I will turn to Toyin Abiodun. And Toyin, you have worked for many years as an advisor to governments on trade and sustainable development policies, uh, particularly in Eastern, Central, and Southern Africa. What are some of the critical considerations that governments need to be factoring in as they craft immediate responses to the pandemic, the pandemic particularly in, the, in this economic space? What are some of the things that governments need to be thinking of in terms of response, but also in terms of the recovery and where areas in which they can increase women's economic participation. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Margot. And uh, let me just say that I'm very, uh, very pleased to be part of uh, this uh, global table discussion with uh, the wonderful and uh, very experienced uh, women. And thank you so much, Mary Kay and Myra, for setting uh, the, the stage there. Um, just to give you some contextual uh, Africa scenery uh, and also linking back globally, uh, women are extremely more vulnerable to economic shocks uh, brought about by crisis of this kind, as uh, Margot was just alluding to. And in particular, um, in Africa, just giving you again uh, I guess the context to uh, just the, the response that I will be providing. Let's consider why women are more at risk um, than their male counterparts. Um, in many African countries, uh, women's participation in the labor market, for example, is often in the form of temporary employment. 
um, um, as the effects of COVID, uh, you know, the pandemic continues to ravage economies, uh, reducing employment opportunities, triggering off uh, lay layoffs, temporary workers and the likes. A majority of them who are women, as uh, Mario was alluding to, um, and th the fact that there isn't sufficient data, um, really just brings to bear that a lot of the women are then expected to bear the, the, bear the brunt and the, heavy, the heaviest, um, actually, brunt of job losses. Um, and bringing it back to Eastern, Central and Southern Africa, um, what governments should be considering, and um, in my role as strategic advisor, I very often put this right at the front of our ministers, uh, is uh, things such as the fact that there aren't safety nets, uh, they're either insufficient or they don't just exist. Um, majority of the women will, will not be rescued um, by social safety nets that don't exist. Um, the, the other point is that the service sector um, is, is burdened with restrictions um, imposed to manage the spread of this coronavirus. And a lot of the female, and these spaces is actually quite dominated by, uh, you know, females. And, and this is obviously the food sector, the hospitality, petty trading, tourism and the likes. And, and these sectors are expected to obviously feel the harshest economic effects from this crisis. Uh, the third point is that, that there are limited or no access to credit for women. Women entrepreneurs are often discriminated against when trying to access credit, as we all are familiar. Uh, the last point there is increased workload for women with very little pay. Uh, this crisis is obviously exposing the fact that uh, a lot of these women, women will have to either, you know, as they lose their jobs or make very difficult decisions, given that they also have to struggle family uh, workload and, and care for, for, for elderly people or just for the home. Um, when, you, when you look at all these various issues that are confronting, uh, you know, the, the sort of the female uh, gender and, and governments, and then you start asking, what is it that governments should be looking at? Firstly, uh, a, a crisis of this kind presents, you know, ever greater cre uh, credence to the universal truth that health is wealth. And in a family where you have the woman, you know, obviously as the breadwinner, you have to prioritize you know, testing for her. And, and these, these are things that we're push, pushing through to governments. That you, you prioritize, it's paramount that you par, prioritize testing. Because should you have this, uh, should this woman fall ill and die, then her entire household just falls into abject poverty. And, and, and this, is, this, is a, this is a reality that governments in, in Africa, East Africa, across the whole of Africa are realizing. There's also the informal sector that was just alluded to and the need for governments to begin to start reimagining structural changes that might be needed there. Um, and the expediency to prioritizing policy levers that could transition women, you know, who make up almost 80% of the informal sector spaces across industry, services, agricultural traders, sectors, and the likes to much more sort of, you know, formal spaces or semi-formal spaces. And there are a couple of uh, ideas I will bring to bear there. Um, the other point is looking at skills and literacy gaps. Then at, at the moment, everything's sort of moving into digital spaces. But then you look at the data that isn't quite there. But given all the work that's been done already, SDG 5 and then women, you know, empowerment and all the great work that's been done, it does really point to the fact that there are literacy issues um, and, and there are skills gaps. And so how do you move women who are predominantly in petty trading, cross-border trading, or you know, in spaces that are absolutely, that pr pretty much informal into having to trade on digital spaces? And this will be the new norm. The market space is moving into digital place uh, or digital spaces. That, that's going to be the new norm. And how do you move them there? So. Uh, the skills development is absolutely key and uh, governments have to start thinking about that. The, 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 the lockdown itself is obviously going to beacon uh, more of those issues because uh, those who would have been studying or doing part-time, you know, trying to upskill, retool, reskill, they obviously now can't do that. So we have to start thinking seriously as to what are the options that are available and I will allude to a couple more. Um, and then the, the, third, the fourth point is just to think about bailouts in, you know, the whole economic stimulus fiscal package as governments are looking at their you know their expenditure how do you creatively look at the informal sector trans, uh, cash transfers you know and a couple other things in that space to help cushion the blow that uh, women are being dealt with
Thank you. Thank you so much, Toyan. That was very comprehensive. And I'll turn now to Professor Orser. Um, because, you know, our goal here is to really shine a light on the issues for the global south, but we're fully aware that this is a global issue. Uh, Professor Orser, given your work um, on women's entrepreneurship and your geographic regions of focus, North America and, and the Middle East, can you help us to understand some of the particular challenges faced by women entrepreneurs? And, in, and then we can come back um, to the issue of the opportunities, but could you, could you at least open this up for us um, and, and help, help us to get a better understanding of these issues? Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Thomas, and my thanks to this uh, distinguished panel, and I'll pick up on some of the points that have already been raised. Uh, we know that the challenges facing women entrepreneurs are now very well documented, and these include access to microcredit, debt and equity financing, access to banking services, financial markets, access to networks. You know, financial literacy and confidence is lower among women entrepreneurs compared to men. And we know that women are less likely to employ ICT technologies. Women are more likely to be engaged in necessity versus opportunity-based entrepreneurship, and that's particularly in developing economies. And we know that women are less likely to be the beneficiaries of publicly funded small business support programs. So the pandemic has amplified all of these gender gaps. In March 2020, the OECD estimated that about half of small and medium enterprises would be out of business by July. And women-owned businesses will be a disproportionate number of these firms. So across most economies, women-owned firms tend to be smaller, and uh, that's in terms of revenue employment. And so they have less capacity to weather the pandemic. Many operate restaurants, accommodation, the cultural tourism, wholesale and retail so industries that have been hardest hit by the pandemic. And it's anticipated that these sectors will be the slowest to recover. And as Myra has indicated, there remains a need to increase both public and government awareness about the gender economic impacts of COVID-19. So G20 governments have introduced a number of small business relief policies, such as WAVE subsidies and loans and deferred taxes. Yet many women entrepreneurs do not qualify due to revenue thresholds or payroll eligibility criteria. And as has been indicated, most relief interventions do not meet the needs of informal and independent workers, the self-employed, cooperatives, and social enterprises. And again, these are the kinds of businesses or the types of businesses that women are more likely to operate. Uh, so in my mind, now is the time for relief policies to bolster the capacity of women entrepreneurs to pivot and to sustain their businesses. Equitable economic recovery will require women-focused and inclusive small business support policies. And that includes provision for access to public procurement, women-focused business recovery centers, and access to digital technologies to enable um, enhancement of their networks and access to capital. And I think equitable economic recovery also infers point two affordable care systems to provide women the time and energy they need to support their business. Because it's revenue and income and earnings that enable many women to acquire assets, to create jobs and to contribute both essential and non-essential goods and services during the pandemic. Thank you very much, Dr. Orser. I'd like to come back to Marike. Um, you have obviously looked at households, particularly those at the base of the pyramid. If in your advice to governments, where is it in terms of the response and recovery act policies that need to be implemented, where is it that you would recommend that they place the priorities, particularly in the context of this whole issue of the social safety net that is so porous or non-existent in many of the countries in Latin America? We heard a similar point raised by Toyin um, with regard to Africa as well. Yeah, well, if you look at the households at the base of the pyramid, which are actually very <laughs> numerous in 
Latin America and and um, Africa and, and many of the developing regions. Uh, the uh, the first concern is to get emergency cash assistance or food assistance to these households uh, because people need food to eat. Um, if you expect social distancing, you have to enable people to be able to feed their families if you want them to stay indoors. Even if you relax social distancing with the economic crisis, these people won't, they have lost their labor income, right? Uh, so emergency cash and in-kind assistance, uh, especially in light of the fact that the schools have closed. Um, and that, of course, I mean, and that's the medium term big issue for these countries is to, I mean, of course, the social distance is, is necessary for uh, uh, containing the pandemic, absolutely. However, it's really important as well to take into account, like bring to the table, the other uh, detrimental physical material health effects that are uh, 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 the secondary effects, as I think it was Myra who mentioned, the secondary effects um, of, of the pandemic. And so issues like every day that the ki kids, girls and boys are not at school, that has, you know, educational impact, it has a nutritional impact, it has a mental health impact. Uh, it also uh, doesn't enable the primary caregivers to go out and work. Um, all those things have costs. Uh, another thing that we haven't talked about is the domestic and gender-based violence that you know has probably very likely increased around the world. Uh, we have we don't obviously have systematic data for that yet, but the anecdotal data shows that reports and calls to hotlines have increased dramatically over the last few months. Uh, so all those factors and the health consequences also need to be at the table when governments consider how to move forward, when to reopen schools, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, thank you very much, Marika. So um, Myra, I'd like to come to you on this. Um, I know we've talked specifically about the need for gender data. But in the context of the SDG 30 agenda, we're well into the last decade. Um, so how can we leverage the efforts to respond and the recovery to really focus on filling those gaps? And where is it that you would advise governments that they need to take immediate action in this context in terms of how they plan those responses and recovery measures to ensure that they can indeed collect data. What needs to be done? Well, one of the things that we are doing right now, Data 2X, is tracking all the possible effects of the pandemic, the primary and the secondary effects, and seeing where are the data, data gaps and how many countries have data gaps in different, in different areas. So, you know, one of the things that we are expecting, okay, the closing of schools will affect probably girls returning back to school more than boys. They will return less. So do we have that data? For that, we probably do have the data because, you know, data for schooling is one of the best data that are sex disaggregated, at least at the enrollment rates. What we have nothing about is mental health data disaggregated by sex. And what we have also very bad data is economic participation data, right? It was huge undercounting. So I think that that is, and that is something that we're doing with Data2x. With Data2x and the Center for Global Development, we're doing a second thing that supposedly is not directly related to the pandemic, but I think it's foundational, is coming up, trying to get international agreement to come up with a simple, reliable measure of women's economic empowerment. We don't have it. If we had that, we can really see what are going to be the effects of the pandemic on empowerment. And it is not obviously that all the time it's going to be negative for women, but I think that we need to understand because in certain circumstances, for instance, in response to conflict, that is another aggregate shock, there has been increased empowerment of women. So, but I think we need to understand that. So that is a critical measurement task that we all need to push governments and the international community to do. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Toyin, I would like to turn to you with a similar question in terms of, as, as you provided policy advice, where do you see there are opportunities to really push forward? Um, and how would you encourage governments to do that in meaningful ways that can be measured? Thank you, uh, Dr. Thomas. Um, I will just allude to a few points. Um, first of all, as I mentioned, the informality um, and the fact that women heavily are basically laid in there. Um, there is a role for government to play um, and government needs to start looking at creating incentives through the line um, that help women plug into value and supply chains as obviously the easing of the lockdown um, starts to happen across economies and prioritize improving the capacity of women to um, women owned businesses and women to exports. And how, could they, how can they do that? There's so many ways to do that. There's several institutions um, of government, as I mentioned through the line, the National Council for uh, you know, Export Promotion, National Councils for Investment Promotion, um, you know, the Customs Authority, the procurement systems across, you know, across governments. They can find ways to start prioritizing women's uh, you know, facilitation through these various systems to help increase you know, their engagement in, in the formal space. And they can help them through regional value chains, national value chains, global value chains, international value chains, working very closely with international organizations. Um, I guess even international organizations have a, a role to play here where they don't come with, you know, arm, uh, you know, I guess, you know, an arms, you know, basically strong arming uh, policies, but working with governments to, and to ensure that local policies um, can, can find room for synergies uh, with international uh, policies. And, and I think even governments should, just as citizens hold governments to account, governments too should hold themselves to account. And what do I mean by this? They should have a carrot and stick approach where they limit funding to these various, uh, I guess, you know, the National Institute, uh, the National, uh, you know, uh, Promotion, Export Promotion Council, for example, should evidence how they've supported women, uh, you know, through, you know, their various annual activities. And with that, they get funding uh, support. These are things that governments can do. These are small levers that they can do. And that's around informality, around skills. You, there's so many things that they can work across sort of a PPP private uh, partnership arrangement where now that everything's moving digital, start looking at tech solutions versus content providers, who can then provide solutions and training, vocational training materials for women who want to obviously move. A lot of them want to move. A lot of them don't even understand the process. Government systems are a bit, you know, quite complicated. These are ways, in, there are opportunities there where people can come in and invest in those infrastructures to create, you know, a, 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 I guess an opportunity for women to easily understand what governments expect of them and, and to make the process more seamless and, and far more straightforward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julian. Um, I'd now like to give the last word because we're beginning to run out of time to Dr. Orser. And Barbara, I do believe that we have the opportunity. We've talked a lot about the role of government and what governments need to do. But clearly government is not the only and primary actor and the spaces related to women's entrepreneurship. Um, yet there is a role for policy. So what would be your recommendations and how would you bring in the private sector in particular to help or to take their role in advancing women's entrepreneurship? Well, thank you. I think one um, initial step is to recognize that the private sector has been making a contribution to COVID response although it's not always that visible. And women entrepreneurs have been at the forefront of a lot of those responses. Uh, in terms of private public, I think Tanya's point about procurement, that this is an underutilized uh, policy lever for most governments, that women entrepreneurs need access to public procurement, and that is a way to bring the private sector into the, uh, the pending spend in the recovery period. I'd also suggest that both private and public training agencies, as noted, need to be more gender smart in terms of the advice and the services that they're providing. And finally, I think investment both in private and public uh, contributors to ICT, uh, enabling affordable ICT, supporting women as they adopt ICT to ensure that they have access to digital resources and the coming um, opportunities that will be presented in the post-pandemic period. Thank you very much, Dr. Orser.
and I'd like to thank our distinguished panel for your contributions. I think I very much am I'm encouraged by the fact that we ended up focusing on the actions. And in a way we've issued our own call to action uh, based on the things that you have each identified as action points. And I hope that certainly in the Think20 space, this would be an important input for the ongoing conversations in terms of the social and economic impacts of the pandemic. Uh, as it affects particularly the global south, but recognizing that this is a global issue, so it's the north as well. And um, sorry about that, that was my timer. Um, and so I want once again to say thank you. This was a very enlightening and encouraging and enriching discussion. And I wish you all the very best going forward. Thank you very much. <laughs>